it's, uh, it's February now, and uh, I think it was the 12th of February, just basically just, just over a year ago, that uh, you were doing that. Talk us through what that felt like a year ago, finishing. Oh, wow. I mean, it, it feels like so much further away than a year ago. I almost can't quite believe that that was me. Um, but yeah, coming into the finish line at the Vendée Globe, something I had dreamed about for over 30 years of my life. Um, it kind of wasn't really what I was expecting because uh, France was in lockdown and, you know, when I'd imagined it in front of my mirror at hol home holding up two flares, uh, there'd been crowds, so my family had been there. <laughs> um, and actually coming into the finish, I was really stressed. I, I was quite upset. Um, I kind of was a bit overwhelmed by the whole thing, but once everyone had jumped on board and, and we started going down the canal in Les Abdelon, it was the proudest I've ever felt in my whole life. So Pip, that was the finish. And obviously before you finish, you got to enter, you got to get there, you got to get a boat to the line. Now that, that seems to me almost harder than the race itself. Talk us through that. Well, take us through your first slide. Yeah, so I guess really, you know, the first thing is why, why the Vendée Globe? Um, and, and for me, you know, the Vendée Globe, I read about it first when I was 17 years old. Um, I just really got into sailing. I was really in love with the idea of the adventure and freedom that sailing offers. And I'd been reading about the round the world races, which were fully crewed. So that was the Whitbread then. Um, I, I, my hero then was Peter Blake. Um, and, you know, I thought, wow, that's what I want to do. And then I opened a magazine and, and came across the Vendée Globe race. And it kind of seemed like the Whitbread with knobs on. It was the Whitbread for hard people. Because um, <laughs> it's single-handed, non-stop around the world in 60-foot boats. Yeah, anything you do on your own becomes a lot harder. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. So, I mean, it seemed like the hardest sailing race in the world. But also, there was this fact that men and women were competing on equal terms. So immediately, it was something that I could do as a female sailor. Um, and, and it just really appealed to me. But the more I found out about it, the more I realized what an incredible sporting event it is. There are not many other events on the planet that last for three months, that require an athlete to perform day and night for three months. And a sporting event that is that tough, that requires that much of a human being, and men and women compete on equal terms, and all ages compete on equal terms. And that, to me, is incredible. That makes it, and I am biased, the most incredible sporting event on the planet. Now, before we go to the next slide, um, we've just seen you race around a virtual <laughs> uh, quick rip, whip around the world. Um, does the world feel smaller to you now that you've sailed around it? <laughs> it really does, actually. <laughs> I mean, it took, so it took me 95 days to get around the world. Um, and those 95 days went by so quickly. Uh, and I, I chunk it up into the, the Atlantic, the, the Southern Ocean and in the Atlantic. And the Southern Ocean is nearly half of it. Um, but yeah, it, it, it went by in a breeze. And the journey to the Vendée took 30 years. And the Vendée itself just went by in the blink of an eye. Well, let's talk about that journey next, I guess. Yeah, so I grew up in uh, Cambridgeshire, landlocked county. Um, I did sail. My, my parents had a cruising boat, so I was lucky enough to go sailing on the East Coast. But I didn't really know anything about racing. I didn't have any influences in my life that could kind of guide me on the way to something like the Vendée Globe. Um, and I did, when I left school, I went down to the South Coast and I got a job as an apprentice sailing instructor. Um, and that's kind of how I cut my teeth really in, in the world of sailing. But it was never racing. And, and I really struggled to find opportunities to go racing and offshore racing in particular. I always felt like I was on the outside looking in. I had no idea how to make that first step, where those opportunities were. Uh, well, we're going to come, come to that a little later about exactly how you do, you know, break those walls down and get through. But uh, first of all, I want to say, what was the race like? Just, just trying to explain. It seems so petty just asking in that one <laughs> sentence, what's the race like? But let's see if and we it, can unpick it. It is, I mean, it's quite, it's extraordinary. On the, on the face of it, you know, it is, 
it's really physical and it's never ending. And um, sometimes when I try to describe what it's like, I say it's like being, not that I've ever done horse riding, but I imagine it's like being sitting on the back of a thoroughbred horse that is jumping over hedges and fences constantly and having to solve a Rubik's Cube puzzle cube puzzle at the same time while you're hanging on going over those fences and being sprayed by a fire hose at the same time <laughs> exactly yeah? yeah so i mean the boats are the mo boats are magnificent this is the boat that i raced in my race so they're class in mocha which effectively is an open 60 they're 60 foot long the mast is 18 meters high under max sail area which is what you can see in this photo i have 600 square meters of sail which is enough to cover three tennis courts and across the fleet, we had uh, 22 years of, of design and build across the fleet. So I was the second oldest boat in the race. Um, and uh, we've got a, pic a video here of my new boat, uh, which is a foiling boat. So that's a 2016 boat. But across the fleet, there's a huge range of design and capability. My last boat was capable, my top speed was 27 knots on my last boat. But the new boat here, um, that, that's capable of, of um, in excess of 30 knots um, quite easily. So that there's a huge range. So Pip, you were racing against this modern design in your old boat. How, how many modern designs were you racing against in, roughly in the, in the fleet? So the fleet was, was, obviously there's the age split, but the fleet was effectively split between foilers and non-foilers. And it was about a half and half split, roughly. In fact, probably one third, two thirds. And so my new boat, the, this one we can see on the screen, um, was the first generation of boat to be designed with foil. So that was 2016. So we had the 2016, 2020 generation boats designed with foils. And just to explain um, what the foil word's all about, basically these hydrofoil uh, based rudders are designed to give the boat a little lift. So when you start getting major speed over the boat, they are designed to just give you a little bit lift and you reduce a little bit of the wetted surface of the boat, a little less drag, go a little bit faster and that all repeats in the rigging and a bit more apparent wind and off you go much faster but it's a tell us what it's like sailing the foiling boat compared to the other one um so i think the interesting thing for me transitioning into a foiling boat now is that it's not harder um, I thought it would be harder, but my old boat, because it was such an old design, it had no protection, absolutely no protection from the waves at all. I had to go forward to do every sail change. I was being, sometimes the water that was coming over the deck was, it would just knock me off my feet. I couldn't stand up against it, but this new one um, is all completely undercover, which makes it easier. And I mean, just getting out of the cockpit, as soon as you get out to the cockpit, you get to the mast, that, you know, I think we've got some pictures of the mast, um, you know, that's a huge thing to, to be able to, if you have the safety of the cockpit and you can stay in that zone where you're being um, sheltered by the waves, the alternative that what you were talking about is getting out of the cockpit, you've got to get into a complete wet weather gear every time you're going to do anything with the sails. I mean, that in itself, just changing into, those, into that kit and getting wet every time you go is a huge drain on your efforts. Yeah, I, I think, you know, the, so we, we just got a video here of me moving. This is prepping for a sail change. So each of these sails weighs about 90 kilos. And every time I wanted to do a sail change, I had to take the sail. So we stack them because the boats are less, they weigh less than 10 tonnes. So any extra weight you have on the boat, you need to put in the right place to, to help performance. And every time I wanted to, to change a sail, the first thing I had to do is get the right sail out. And it was always on the bottom of the pile. And this looks like quite dry day. You've got no water <laughs> sloshing down the deck. <laughs> yeah, this is, you can tell this is a dry day because I don't have my dry top on. Um, but I think, you know, one of the more difficult things about sailing a boat like this that is so, you know, the older designs that have less protection is that it's really easy to go, oh, I can't be bothered. Because no one's there. 
No one's checking on you. No, no one is monitoring your performance. You're only accountable to yourself. You can make up any story you like. You can justify not changing a sale. You can justify not going out on deck because you're cold and you're wet and you're tired. So you have to make yourself do the right thing. And, and even now, you see I've got one sale here that, that's not tied down. Yeah, that's a risk in itself. So every time I move a sale, I take a sale out, I move that sale, I put that sale back, I strap it down. Because if I don't, if that little lazy devil on my shoulder says, ah, don't worry this time, big wave comes, sale goes over the side, I'm a sale down. And what about Mother Nature? Was she part of your plan? Did, did, did uh, every time you put a reef in, did, did it stay that condition? Or oh, 20 minutes later, no. did it not change? No. <laughs> no, and actually reefing, reefing. So I've got a, a picture of me at the mast. Reefing was one of the most challenging things for me. I was the only boat in the whole fleet that had a main halyard on the mast and I had a top grind winch to get that main halyard up. Every single other person had their main halyard in the cockpit and they got it up with the pedestal. Um, and so for me, putting a reef in is... It, you get to the point where you have to put the reef in. It's taking it out that's the challenge. And most most of the boats, they have all of this uh, led back to the cockpit, so you can do it in the comfort of the cockpit, the safety of the cockpit. You're not exposing yourself up on that. Uh, it's the equivalent of making a cup of tea in the kitchen or climbing to the loft every time you want a <laughs> cup of tea, I guess. That's a very good analogy. I like that, yeah. And I drink a lot of tea. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it, it, was, it was really, it was really hard. Um, but, you know, my whole mentality about, about my race was it had taken me 30 years of hard graft to get to that start line. So hard. You know, so I had sacrificed so much. I put so much on the line. But also the many, many people who contributed, who physically helped, who supported me. And I just kind of thought, if I do not make the most of every single second of this race, if I'm not accountable for every single second, then I have wasted the most incredible opportunity of my life. And I was not going to do that. So no matter how much I, how knackered I was, how awful I felt, you know, sometimes to get up, up to that mast, to, to shake the reef out, you know, I would be crawling because I didn't trust myself to stand, but I did it. And I just said, okay, just do it in your own time. Just do it. Now, Pip, this is a picture. We've got the sun setting. There's no, you've got uh, beautiful conditions. What's it like to go bat out of hell in these boats? Absolute screaming along. What's that like? It is unbelievable. And that for me, you know, that is that is the, that's the why. That's why I want to go back. That's why I will do it again. Because actually, the feeling of pushing one of these boats to the absolute limit on your own in the middle of the night, thousands of miles from anywhere, the power that comes through the boat, the vibrations, the noise, you can feel it in every part of your body. It is amazing. Now, this won't ever transpose you to the Southern Ocean, but I believe we've got some video to, I do, yeah. to, to give you a little yeah. feeling of what it might be like. Uh, so this was actually Christmas Day. Happy Christmas, everyone. <laughs> I got my Christmas pudding hat on, you see. And that, I just, I couldn't get enough of that. But the, the thing that I love about this race, the thing I love about these longer races, is that you're learning all the time. You make a mistake, you can learn from it, and you push that a little bit harder next time. And, and that's kind of, for me, my best position in the race was 15th. Um, so in the middle of the Southern Ocean, not long after this was taken, I was lying 15th. I was ahead of seven foiling boats in the second oldest boat in the fleet. And I never, when I started, I never imagined I would be in that position. But I worked out how to push the boat hard. I worked out how to just take, you know, a, a more aggressive line on the weather systems. And each time a weather system came over, I was just gunning for it. It was great. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like everyone to put their hands together because that is an amazing feat. <laughs> That's what you should have been hearing from the Southern Ocean because the whole nation was following you. And when you were just just up there it was fantastic absolutely fantastic and i think that's when the nation really got behind you 
the fact that uh, you were out there just slaying it in this <laughs> old boat with absolutely not a care. Yeah, the one person who wasn't 100% behind me was uh, my technical director, Joff, um, who every, every time he kind of looked at the tracker and I was the fastest boat in the fleet over, you know, 24 hours, he just would send me text messages going, do you have to? <laughs> Now that's that's all the whiz bang of it all. But but daily life, just living, um, keeping yourself warm, getting yourself fed, uh, fixing things. Everything starts breaking. Just yeah. constant maintenance. Talk us through that. I mean, that's the thing that the, the sailing is the treat, but but there is everything else around it. And and effectively, you you are managing a sixty foot boat that would normally have a crew of fifteen, uh, and you're you're doing that sleep deprived for three months in in really difficult environmental conditions and this picture is of my living space so this was it this is where I had to do everything um, so you can see just on the right of the screen there's my um, navigation seat and and the keypad and and um, just up on the bulkhead there is the computer that I used for all my nav and my media and my comms um, I'm actually mid repair there so the area I'm sitting on that's the area that I slept on um, uh, it's the area, so in the in the bottom left of the screen, you can see my jet boil, that's where I cooked. Um, everything in this one area, most of the time it was soaking wet, sometimes it was filthy, so it wasn't actually often that I took my foul weather gear off because I couldn't. And the jet boil was just a really fast way of, of boiling some water, open a packet, freeze dried all the way through. Exactly, yeah, I had to, I had to make water. I was um, making water every other day um, and then, yeah, just eating freeze-dried food um, all the way around. And then I guess the other thing, you know, that you touched on was the, the maintenance, which is ongoing. You know, there is, you are, you are working a boat really hard and, and, and any boat needs maintenance because you're, it's lots of moving parts. It's a, salt water is a really aggressive environment. We were going from extreme heat to extreme cold. So I had to keep on top of the maintenance, but also fix things that broke. Um, and I, I basically kept on top of everything by writing lists around the boat. And I would work on that with um, my technical director, Joff. So we would exchange lists. He would remind me to, to check things, to maintain things. I would tell him about my current list. And the way I kept on top of it was writing on the side of the boat because then it was always in my mind. And the, and the jobs, you know, you, you don't stop the boat to do a job, you're racing. So I had to go to where the work was. I spent a lot of time out on the end of the boom. I spent too much time at the top of the mast. How did you get yourself to the top of the mast? Oh, it's terrifying. <laughs> it is so awful. Um, so you, you, you basically, you hoist a, a climbing rope um, up on one of the halyards that's on a halyard lock. So that gets fixed to the top of the mast. And then you use the same kit that tree surgeons use. So it's a, it's a, a self belay device and, and you have a foot loop and you stand in the foot loop and then pull the belay up. Yeah, yeah, it's, it, is, it is awful. This, this time, going up the mast this time, it took me two and a half hours of self-talk to actually clip myself onto the rope because I was so terrified. Um, it is the most awful thing in the whole world. Really bad. But uh, this time round, um, I think 75% of the competitors had to climb the mast at some point. Um, it's not good. And these are things you practice before. So you put together little emergency repair kits. Uh, you have to think about all the things that could go wrong. There's only so many spares you can take. Uh, I mean, just the whole preparation must have been absolutely incredible. And that really is down to yourself and the shore team. Yeah, you have to think through every scenario. You know, we basically walk through the whole boat and look for weaknesses and try and map out scenarios and then, and then work out how we can reuse items to, to make repairs and to help. So this next video, you can see I'm actually... So here I'm in the back of the boat and my steering gear was loose. And so I had to cut up a baler to make plastic shims to hold the steering position in place, uh, the steering gear in place. And it's those sorts of little things. You do have to be quite inventive. And it's a proper Apollo 13 thing. You know, if I've got a problem and I can't work out how to solve it, or even if I think I know, then I will call into my shore team, 
they know every single thing that's on the boat. It's all, all itemized. They know which bag it's in. So they can say, go to the red bag, pull out this box in here, you'll find this. And they, you know, I tell them what I'm running low on and then we kind of have to work solutions together. And I think obviously the, the biggest solution we worked together was um, changing a rudder in the Southern Ocean. Um, so I, I broke my rudder when I was lying 15th, that made me cry. Um, and, uh, and we had identified this as a possible weakness on the boat. So I had a spare rudder on board and um, Joff had designed a way to replace the rudder while at sea. Um, and the biggest problem with that is that the rudder is buoyant. And so you've got to pull the old rudder out um, and, and get the new rudder in from underneath, and that's hard. So the rudder shank has to, the shaft has to be in that uh, angle in order to, to go up the hole to go back up. And so you're, you're, the boat's moving, it's doing sort of two or three knots the match, as much as you try to slow it down. And so there's water going by, and you've got to sink the rudder enough to get it down in order to line it up. I mean, it's, it, how, how, how the hell did you do that? <laughs> I, I've done it but with someone in the water, and that yeah. was hard enough, and it took us about five hours. So You did it on your own. So it was, it was all set up. My new rudder was kind of ready to go. And the, the key to it all is actually having this, um, just on the bottom, you see the, the little bit that says chain. Um, so that was an old flare container that was full of all of the anchor chain that I had on the boat. And I dropped that down to um, about five or six metres underneath the boat. And, and that had a block on the top of it. Um, and then I drilled a hole in the old rudder and pulled it down to that anchor chain. I think we've got a picture of uh, some video <laughs> of you trying to do this. So this is me, actually, you can see here the, the line coming up through the rudder bearing. So you, you didn't choose a sunny day for this? Oh, Flat it's awful. Form. No? <laughs> it's awful. <laughs> um, I just passed through Point Nemo, which is the most remote place on the planet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so this is, I'd got the old rudder out, the new, new rudder, um, this is the moment I was throwing, throwing it over the side to then sink it down and pull it back into the boat. And I'm, at the moment, you can just see here, I'm marking it because once you're inside, it'd be really easy to put the rudder in back to front. So I marked the stock so I knew which, which way forward was. And this was the worst moment because you've got this brand new rudder and a hole in the boat and then you have to throw it over the side. So I can assure you, I checked my knots many, many times. But the, the I mean, the, there was still a massive swell w when I did this. Um, it, it was, it basically was a, a lull between gales. Um, and I reckoned I had a, a, a lull of about 10 hours and the sea state only kind of calmed down. I, I, I was running out of time, um, so I'd, I waited sort of six hours for the sea state to calm down and then decided to do it. But I was struggling to slow the boat down, but also the, the up and down movement from, from the swell was, was pretty bad. You can see the rudder just floating off into the and distance there. that's the point, there. you dropped it. Yeah. And it, then the chain's got to start sinking it down. Yeah, so then you pull it down towards the chain and then pull it up into Incredible. the boat. Yeah. <laughs> Mind blown. <laughs> so that seemed like a pretty bad bit. Um, but you were telling me some pretty low moments in the ent in, in, entire race. And ladies and gentlemen, think of the date, because especially France, the whole world was very much in lockdown. Yeah. What, is that, what did that feel? Um, so I, I get often, often I get asked, don't you get lonely? And... And actually, you know, when I think about that race, when I think about the best moments and the worst moments, there were some low moments. But in truth, the only time that I ever felt lonely was this moment. And this was walking down the dock to the start. And it had been such a battle to get to the start. You know, I, 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 it's really hard for me to articulate how hard it was to get to that start line and how many times I gave up hope and I didn't think it would happen. And I ended up there and for 30 years I had been imagining it and I never imagined I would be walking down that dock on my own. But because France had gone into lockdown and because, 
you know, we were really lucky in 2020 that we were one of the only major international sporting events to be allowed to be held. We had to have some very strict quarantine rules. And we kind of decided that in the week prior to my start, I would be quarantining with the people who would be at, on the start um, pontoon with me. And that was supposed to be my family. But then the travel restrictions came in and they couldn't come over. So we kind of ended up with a, a team of people who had partly been stranded there and, and partly we had help from the RYA to get some people over there as well at the last minute. Um, but walking down that dock entirely on my own, without people holding my hand and kissing me and hugging me, was the loneliest moment of the whole race. And it was really hard to feel positive about a start that I had imagined so, so much for so much of my life. Um, but kind of one, once I got going, then I really, really was free. And, and because I'd expected to be on a, my own and I chose to be on my own and, and I was, I had the ultimate freedom when the rest of the world was locked down then it felt completely different. And, and I never feel lonely when I'm sailing. Well, you got underway and you got past this moment, uh, but the difficulties didn't stop there. You had a few other little setbacks that you, you always knew you, you were going to have, but you just didn't know what they were going to be. Um, yeah, so this little fella was a bit of a, a, a surprise for me and, and actually was probably, the, of my whole race, this, this is a Portuguese man of war and this, this gave me the worst time in my whole race. We had prepared for every eventuality on the boat and I was ready for every eventuality on the boat. I never imagined that it was me that was going to be the problem. And I got stung by this. Uh, it was when I was coming back up the Atlantic. I'd lost a lot of weight. I was in a, a bad place anyway. Um, physically, I'd, I'd lost a lot of energy and weight and I think my immune system was probably not great. And I had an allergic reaction, which looked like that and then kind of spread all over my whole body. So I looked like that. Um, and then we move on because you don't want to look at that. Um, <laughs> and, and I was ill for four weeks. Um, for four weeks, I, I was ill. I was working with my medical team on the shore to try and get better. But it was so out of my control. And with every other problem that I'd had, I kind of felt it was within my power to make the problem go away, but this, I couldn't make it go away. And, and at the same time, I was overtaken by the remaining foiling boats in the fleet, <laughs> which also made me cry. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that, I mean, that was a surprise. I wasn't expecting that, yeah. All right, well, let's quickly move to some of the better <laughs> bits, because uh, there must have been some real highlights as well. And, you know, I've talked about how amazing it is sailing the boat, and that really is. But, you know, I think the, the biggest highlight for me was actually an unexpected performance. I hadn't expected to do that well. And one of the things I loved about the race was the fact that I constantly had the chance to do well. And this is, so this is an animation coming into the finish. I got, I got better about, if we just pause there. So it, oh, I got better um, about a week before the finish. And the four foiling boats had overtaken me. And I kind of thought, right, I'm going to get, I, ca I can still beat a couple of them. I'm going to get back at them. And i um, not sure how I make this go. Oh, there we go. So, um, so coming into the finish, I started to gain miles on the four foiling boats ahead of me. Um, and... And all the way until the finish, even on the last day, I believe that I could get these boats. And, that, and I think that's one of, that was one of the things about the race was it wasn't, o it wasn't over until I'd crossed the finish line. And I still really, really believed that I could be ahead of them. So this, these are the guys I should have been with. Um, and, and further back here, so there's Alexia, who was in a boat of the same age as me. You know, I was a whole continent ahead of them. But... The funny thing was that the foiling boats ahead of me, so I finished within 24 hours of four foiling boats and only just over three hours behind the last foiling boat in the fleet. And, 
Alan and Stefan, who were the two boats ahead of me, they they were really worried coming into the finish to the extent that there was a there was a pressure system in the Biscay that they decided to go north of, and I could see it was faster south, but it was just going to be rougher, and um, and they were texting me to try and get me to follow them round to the north because they were so worried <laughs> I was going to beat them, but I mean that's. That's an incredible thing about the race is you just have so many opportunities to do better. And I love that. Tell me, what's, what's it like within the whole fleet? You've got a lot of people that you meet before the race, some people that you've raced against in previous races. What's, what's, the, what's the feeling across the fleet and those sailors who all do something very special and all know that they're in a, an incredible fraternity? It, it is an incredible community to be part of. I mean, we did miss out a bit on it because, because of COVID in, in 2020. But um, many of these sailors I've raced against in other classes, but in particular the mini class. And, you know, we're all competitors. There isn't there, you know, particularly in the newer boats, there's a, there's a huge element of secrecy across design and development and all of that sort of thing. But then people still go out and train together. And when we're actually out there on the water, we're all super aware of the fact that if something happens and and this was evidenced in this race with Kevin Escoffier and Jean Lacam. Um, if something happens, it's the rest of the fleet that we will be relying on to rescue. And so, you know, we had a WhatsApp group among us all. We were all constantly chatting. If somebody had a problem, you know, we would be encouraging them. So it is a really close community. It's a great part. So once you get into that community, obviously you, you will look after yourselves. But something we've talked about before is is just how hard it is to get to the line and i'm not talking about just the line of that race to actually get into that kind of racing to to break down those walls tell us something about that because for me that needs to change you obviously had a pretty hard run at it yeah i I think it it is really hard and and certainly you know i've been i've I've seen how it's done in france and 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 I think they have a very different view of this kind of sailing over there. They have academies and, and a lot of more, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's more of a pathway, isn't there? Yeah, and I, you know, I think, I think that the problem, the problem we face in the UK is, is finding the opportunity to have a go, finding the opportunity to get that experience, to get those miles. Um, and certainly, you know, access to boats is really difficult. Um, and I think we also suffer a little bit from this kind of ideal that um, every racing campaign, every boat launch has to be absolutely perfect rather than just kind of saying we're in this for the experience let's go out and do it and you know one of the things I very much want to do is kind of just change the mentality around what it is to go out on the water you know every experience on the water is valid and I believe that there is a kind of sailing for every person out there it's the most incredibly diverse sport and we just kind of need to encourage all of those grassroots opportunities and grassroots um, sailing schemes to get more people into the sport, and that's going to benefit everyone. Well, Pip, I know you're a huge champion for that, and I, I know that you'll do everything you can, as well as trying to win the next race um, to, to help people along. And I know I can see a few uh, faces. Kate here, this is a... It's lovely to see you in the audience uh, listening to Pip, and I'm sure, I hope we haven't put you off. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll be talking to Kate later in the show, but uh, no, I mean, so that was, that was the finish. Incredibly exciting. Uh, and I was watching some media the other day, and uh, you went back to the boat, and you picked up the cap from the flare. <laughs> and because I know it's one of those moments that when you finish a race, it's, it's like, you know, for, you know, going through that, that ribbon uh, for an offshore sailor to get those double flares on the, on the foredeck. Just tell us what was that like? Oh, it, I mean, it was, it was just, it, just, I mean, it was just, it was an incredible night. It, it, and I, I, you know, again, it was, it was a bittersweet moment for me because we were still in lockdown and, and so the kind of welcoming party was nine strong. Um, again, not what I had imagined, but going down the canal, having 
everyone on board just so happy to see me. And then, and I had um, Paul Larson on the front of the boat, and he just fastest man in the world. He just kept lighting flares and handing them to me. And my arms were getting really tired. And then, of course, Jean Le Cam jumped on the boat and kind of wouldn't let go of me. Legend. <laughs> Which was just, it was so surreal. But by the time I'd got in, you know, what what the race committee did, what the organising committee did, and the mayor of Les Abdelon um, gave a, an exemption for people having to be part of the curfew. And, you know, they made me feel so special. And I just could not stop smiling all the way down, you know, got into the dock. And, and when I walked off, I... Everyone was saying to me, what's next, what's next, what's next? Unequivocally, another one. Bring it on tomorrow. Not in this boat, not in this boat. I'm finished with that boat. Um, <laughs> but, you know, there was never any doubt in my mind. It was the greatest thing I've ever, ever, ever done. And I know I can do better. And I'm, I'm just desperate to do it again. Well, can you talk us a little bit through your new campaign and uh, what that's looking like? We've already seen your new boat. Yeah, so the new boat is... Um, we're, it, the, well, the new boat is fantastic. Um, it holds the course record. Um, it was bank popular in 2016. Bureau Valley, it came third in 2020. It's now Medallia. Um, and I bought it off this guy here. This is Louis Burton, who's moved into his new boat, which is a third generation foiler. Um, this year, or last year, I didn't do a huge amount of sailing. I got to go sailing with Louis, which was great. That was a crash course in cowboy foiling um, <laughs> and um, but it you know it's amazing to be able to go sailing with another Vendée skipper I mean that that really is was incredible um, and most of what we did last year was actually growing the team because I, I didn't have a team before then um, my team kind of was really thrown together before the Vendée and and now we we actually have a technical team we've got we've opened up junior preparator positions we've got an internship on the business side and and, and that's been quite hard. It's been a process for me because all of a sudden, you know, I, I, I'm running a business now as, as well as as well as a sailing campaign and I'm responsible for quite a lot of people. And we wanted to make sure we got it right. So we took it easy last year. And then this year, you know, is really focusing on the sailing. But kind of, I guess what I'm really looking forward to and the reason I put this video in is to give you an idea of what's possible. So you have to look quite quite carefully. Um, <laughs> so this is a few minutes of video and uh, this will really give you a taste well, this, of so what it's about. So this, this one is um, just, we go in this video, um, we go past a non-foiling boat in Louis's foiling boat. So this was when I did the Ocean Race Europe with him. Um, and it looks like the foiling boat is standing still and this is what I need to get to grips with this year. So here we go, bleep, bleep, there you go. That, that non-foiling boat was doing 17 knots. <laughs> you can water ski at 17 <laughs> knots. And yeah, I think we were doing like 32, 33 when we went past him. It was amazing, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, I mean, my team, brilliant, small but perfectly formed. Um, and and um, yeah, so I mean, this year we're just, we've got five races this year. Um, the, the, the interesting thing is that I, I still need to qualify for the Vendée Globe. It's not, pre, in previous years, if you finished the Vendée Globe, you got an automatic entry to the next one. They've taken that away now. Um, but the Vendée is um, more popular than ever. They've opened the spaces up to 40. Last time we had 33 starters. This time they're allowing 40. Currently there are 52 teams interested. So we have to fight for our places, which means I've got to race and I've got to finish races. So my first race this year is going to be in May, May the 8th. Um, that's a solo race from Brittany to the Fastnet Rock down to Finisterre and back. And then in June, I'm doing the Vendée Arctique, which is from Les Sabdelon round um, Iceland and back. Uh, and then in the middle of the year, around Britain and Ireland. And then we finish with uh, the Route de Rum. Is that all? <laughs> <laughs> it's busy. <laughs> and of course, you've got to maintain the boat between that and everything. So um, now we're we ready to take some questions while we, while we watch this. Uh, have we got any questions from, from the audience, sir?
So this is a, a question about sleeping. How, how do you manage the sleeping? And so I think you, you do, the sleeping is a hard thing to learn, um, I, but I, I, learnt, I learnt how to, it's effectively it's polyphasic sleeping, and I, I learnt how to do that um, kind of through trial and error the first time I ever went solo, um, and, and I haven't forgotten how to do it. And it's all about being really honest, self-aware and self-critical. So in any given moment, I will, you know, every half an hour or so, I will ask myself, you know, what, what do I need now? What does the boat need now? What do I need now? And I need to understand also, it's not just about how I physically feel, it's about my mental ability to um, risk assess things as well. So I do, when I'm super tired, I do mental arithmetic. And if I'm struggling with mental arithmetic, I know I need to sleep. And then it's looking for opportunity. Um, so, you know, it, in the new boat, I won't sleep for longer than 30 minutes. You, you can't, it, it, everything is changing too much, too quickly. But you kind of look, you look at the time that you have sometimes, you just kind of go, okay, I desperately need to sleep. So I am going to sleep for 10 minutes and that's it. And you feel better. Or sometimes you say, no, I've got a full 30 minutes. I'm going to take this. And then you wake up and everything's okay. And then you can do another 30. So it's kind of just looking for opportunity, being really self-aware. Um, and, and I guess taking sleep whenever you can. Well, uh, I mean, I, I've done a bit of offshore and I, I was allowed to have uh, nice crude offshore uh, with nice long um, off watches to share. Uh, doing it on your own, I cannot imagine. And certainly being sleep deprived on top of that. So uh, um, do we have any other questions? I'm sure we do. So the question there was, was where did Pip find that mental strength on that day to change that rudder? I think I know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think this kind of really just comes back to why I love this sport. Um, and it's because you don't have a choice. You have to be that person. You have to find that strength because no one else is going to do it for you. And I think, you know, being out in the ocean being challenged, choosing to challenge myself in the way that I do, forces me to be a version of me that I just don't get on the land. Um, and, and there's this just this raw, it's, it's a raw necessity. Things have to work out because they, they have to, there is no other option. Um, and, and so it just, it, it comes to you. I, I, I was once told there's option one, or there's option one, or there's option one. <laughs> Choose your options. <laughs> Any other questions, sir? So question of how, how do you raise the funding? I see you want to have a wonderful sponsor and lots of partners. So the question, I guess, is how do you raise the funding? It's, it's, it's the hardest part of it. It's, it, it's hugely difficult. And, and I, you know, I was really lucky in that um, I didn't have for my last Vendée. So, so my last Vendée, I decided I'd been looking for a, a sponsor forever and just knocking on doors like everyone else and nothing was happening. And the opportunity to charter this old knackered boat turned up and I, I took a bank loan out to cover the first few months and then I decided, okay, I'm gonna make this work as a one woman team. I will force this thing into being. And, and by actually doing that, 
I'm taking the risk away for, I'm not, and I, you know, I'm proving already that I can do this. And so the idea was I would just kind of crawl along the bottom and eventually someone would go, well, she's trying really hard. Um, <laughs> and I had a, I had a crowdfund, um, volunteers helped me, people donated to the crowdfund. Um, I had a, a business syndicate where um, smaller businesses who couldn't afford, you know, a title sponsor put in monthly payments. So it's kind of just, but I was crawling along the bottom always and then, Medallia rang me. So what I thought would happen, happened. They saw that I was qualified. They saw that I'd made it so far on my own and that was an endorsement for them. It, it, it matched their values. And so they, they rang me and they became title sponsor and then carried on. But, you know, we still have a funding gap and we're still looking for sponsors and it, it, it's hard work. Well, I'm, I'm going to say, because you're, you're, you're too proud to say it, but I want everybody to get onto her website, follow Pip on social media, really get behind her campaign and, uh, you know, wish her luck for, for the next event. And if you know any millionaires out there, point them, <laughs> point them this way. Now, Kate, do you, do you have a question for Pip? Kate just sailed round uh, uh, Britain on her own at the age of 14. So, Kate, there's a yeah. There we go. So, Kate, I know wants to get into the mini transat. Any advice? And and actually, it is so. Out of the 33 sailors that that, that were on the start line of the last one day, 18 of us had done minis. So it is a it's a, an incredible um, fleet and community to be part of, and it is a great learning ground. And um, I got into it by um, uh, so I I lived on a boat, uh, and I, I that was a, a 39 foot cruiser racer. And I sold my home to buy my mini, and I moved into a van. Um, <laughs> so, but the the great thing about the mini, and it goes back to my earlier point about you know things don't have to be gold plated, is that it's the biggest one. It was the biggest fleet of of um, close to matched boats that sail solo, and across the whole range of the fleet, you have a massive range of ages of boats, types of boats and budgets. And so actually, you know, the way into the Mini is to, to, to get hold of whatever boat you can and then just go and join the fleet and, and start racing with them. It's about doing something rather than waiting for the perfect thing. Absolutely. And Dad, don't forget to sell the house. <laughs> um, I have one last question. We're going to wrap things up here. Um, Pip, when you close your eyes and think of the one motivational picture in your mind that's going to get you to the next race, that's going to get you through the next race, what is that? What's that, it, that, what's that picture in your mind? It's, it's my memories of, of pushing the boat hard in the Southern Ocean, and it's actually, you know, it's a, it's a whole body experience. It's just that that kind of adrenaline coursing through your veins. It's, it's the noise of the boat screaming. It, it's, you know, the, the, the sound of the water running down the deck. It's watching that little dot on the screen, knowing you're going just a little bit faster than everyone else. You know, that is, it's the most incredible blend of, of, of nature and design and engineering and human ability and and you're at the center of it and and it is like a drug it's amazing <laughs> well pip we wish you luck and thank you very much for coming to boat life live 2022 uh, you've opened the show you've given us an incredible talk please ladies and gentlemen put your hands together for pip hair thank you thank you <laughs>